Another student I should tell you about is Mr. Ponder. This is a young man who, as a freshman, was the shortest member of his class. As such, he had the honor and distinction of carrying the urban prep school mace at convocation, another one of our rituals, opening celebration, where our guys actually, you know, here I'm acapella. So we have this thing at the beginning of the year called convocation, and I love convocation because it's kind of like the reverse of graduation. Um, it's the beginning of, you know, a student's high school career. And so we invite all the parents and their families to come. We have a big auditorium, and we have all the young men come in, and they walk in with their white shirts and their red ties and their khaki pants, but no blazer, because they haven't earned their blazer yet. And we have this whole ceremony, and then we call their name, and we have them walk across the stage, and then we don their blazer. We put the blazer on them, and then they become an urban prep man. It's a fantastic, it's a, such a simple, simple thing to do, and it's amazing. I mean, you know, literally, you know, 100 kids, right, freshmen, and you will have 2,000 family members <laughs> just to see their you know, student get, because these guys are never honored. They go through their whole lives never being honored. And so just being able to say, I'm part of something, and I get this blazer, is something special for them. Okay, so anyway, at this convocation, we have someone carry the urban prep mace, and we always pick the shortest student in the class to carry the mace. So, um, because the mace is gigantic, and we think it's funny, really. <laughs> so, um, and they're so little when they're freshmen, so it's really, really funny. Anyway, so, um, Mr. Ponder, he got to carry the mace in our, uh, in our convocation. And, you know, Mr. Ponder was incredibly, incredibly industrious. And he was a little bit too industrious. So industrious that he wanted to make a little extra money, so he decided he would create a fight club. This kid would get two classmates together and have them box barefisted in the bathroom and then charge other students <laughs> to watch them during school. So Mr. Ponder would say, can I go to the bathroom? Then some two other kids would say, can they go to the bathroom? And then all of a sudden we noticed there were five, six, seven, eight kids all going to the bathroom at the exact same time. We'll come to find out that um, Mr. Ponder, or I should call him Mr. Don King, <laughs> was, you know, fight promoter. We found out about this. And, you know, one of the lines of the creed, you know, is we choose to live honestly, nonviolently, and honorably. And there, frankly, was nothing, nothing honest or honorable about, uh, or nonviolent about what he was doing, <laughs> clearly. Um, so, you know, I think that Ponder had a shield, right? But he, because, you know, he was a real confident guy, but he was misusing this shield. So we didn't have to teach him how to, you know, get a shield, we had to teach him how to use it right. And I have to tell you that it was one of the lowest points of you know, my education career, because I was sitting in the office looking at him and just shaking my head, because you know, I, I have, you know, I'm very proud to say that I have never been in a physical altercation in my entire life, and I ain't no punk. <laughs> and so when kids fight, it really, really you know, rubs me the wrong way because it just isn't you know, necessary and we really have to get out of this mode that I gotta you know, fight. And certainly I shouldn't be profiting from fighting you know, or something. But anyway, so I really wanted to put them out. I really, really wanted to put them out. And it took, you know, I had a little you know, angel on my shoulder saying, but remember at Urban Prep, we don't throw away kids, even those who think they wanna be discarded. So we let uh, Mr. Ponder stay. And the following year, Mr. Ponder's mother moved out of the state. And you got to live in the district in order to go to urban prep. So he had to transfer from urban prep. And um, he came to me and said, Mr. King, I don't want to leave urban prep. And I was like, you know, why? Because, you know, the fighting's too good here? What's up? <laughs> and he says, no, I'm through with them. Through with the, I don't want to leave because this is my family. This is my home. This is where I belong. I said, man, you gotta go. Your mom's moving to, you know, it was Indiana. It wasn't like she was moving to, you know, North Carolina, but she was moving nonetheless. You gotta go. He goes, please, 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 you have to help me. 
And so we found a relative for him to stay with, and we managed to find some money to allow him to be able to go home on weekends or go visit his mom on weekends. I got to be careful because the Department of Education is here, so I can't say go home to Indiana when he was enrolled at Chicago. Uh, but he had a Chicago address. <laughs> he was living with a relative in Chicago. And so we're clear. Um, so we, you know, he would, you know, sometimes he would, you know, travel like two hours to, you know, visit his mom on the train and then come, you know, back to Chicago. Um, and this is how much, you know, this young man wanted to be at Urban Prep. And recently I was giving a talk at a dinner and I invited uh, an Urban Prep grad to attend the event. And I sat at this table listening to this cat and he was a freshman at, the, at Illinois State University. And he told me all about his double major and his leadership in the campus NAACP and you know, his work as a tutor and mentor to, at two elementary schools and all this great stuff. And you know, frankly, literally I sat there and I started crying because I thought, what if I had put him out for starting a fight club? What if I had stopped believing and gave up on that kid? What if we had not stepped up and redirected his use of his shield? I have one more story for you. Um, we had a student, and this one might really make you cry. We had a student named uh, Mr. Gardner who once said to me that he was tired of all these men telling him what to do. I responded, you mean you're tired of all these adults telling you what to do? He said, no, I don't mind the females telling me what to do. That's just like my mom. It's all these men who think they can tell me what to do that gets on my nerves. You see, Mr. Gardner's father had OD'd when he was a young child, so he had been forced to navigate the world without any adult supervision from a man, without any guidance from a man without any leadership from a man. And so when he got to Urban Prep, he resented the fact that we have so many, 60% of our teachers and administrators are African-American males. He, was, he resented the fact that so many black men were telling him what to do all of a sudden, that he really fought hard against it. And it was a real, real struggle to get Mr. Gardner through um, four years at Urban Prep. Uh, I couldn't believe it, but uh, he made it. And he graduated from Urban Prep, and I was very proud that he had graduated because it was really, 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 really tough along the way. And then, um, you know, a couple weeks after, or a couple weeks into summer, I called him and I said, hey, you know, Mr. Gardner, you all set to, you know, go to college, you know, need anything, what's up? And he said, oh, I'm not going to college. And I say, you're crazy. Haven't you heard 100% of Urban Prep graduates? <laughs> of course you're going to college. He said, no, I'm not going. I have to um, stay here and take care of my family. See, remember, his dad had OD. He had a mother and a younger sister. And he was the man in the household he felt that it was his responsibility to take care of the family and be the breadwinner. What I think he was really communicating was that he had this shield that somehow had been built and developed, but it was now broken. He had given up on himself and his future. I told him, you can stay out of school, and get a job in a fast food restaurant or maybe a clothing store and you can earn maybe eight, 10 bucks an hour. You can get a job that'll give you a couple hundred bucks a week or you can go to college, get a degree, get a career that will pay you thousands of dollars. And I did the math for him. Over the course of your lifetime, this is how much money you can make with a college degree. I asked him, did he believe in himself? And he had to make a decision. He had to decide if he believed in his potential and if he believed in, him, in, his, in, his, in his worth, if he believed in his shield. At the end of August, Mr. Gardner called me 
And I was not happy with the prospect of that telephone call. Because if there was one thing I knew about Gardner, it was that he was incredibly pig-headed. And once he said he was going to do something, made up his mind, that was it. And so the phone rang. I saw the caller ID. And I really sat there. I was like, you know, I shouldn't even answer this call. You know, I don't want to hear this. And then I kind of, you know, just, you know, said, it's cool. Because, you know, it's OK if all of the students don't go to college, as long as we have done our job in preparing them and giving them the option to be able to get there. 